We remember that 10 years ago today, um, nearly 3,000 people were lost in New York City, in the Twin Towers, also in the Pentagon, and in a field in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're reminded that 6,000 people, a little over 6,000 people were, were injured on that day. It's been suggested that one in five Americans either were directly affected by the events of 9-11 or who knew somebody close who was directly affected by the events of 9-11. And those statistics change us. They, they're a different, we're a different nation because of that day. But statistics and numbers can only go so far. They're just statistics. They're just numbers. It's the stories that really touch our hearts. It's the people's lives that were changed that really make things different. I, I heard a story about one of the firefighters that was in the second tower to collapse. And he was one of the handful of people who made it out alive after the collapse. And when he came, when he was calling on his radio for help, it took 45 minutes for anyone to respond because of all the chaos of that moment. But then after when he finally got someone to respond to his mayday, he, he said, I'm going to tell you right exactly where I'm at. He said, you go through the, the glass doors, I'm on the second um, second stairwell to the right, stairwell B, up between the second and fourth floor, that's exactly where I'm at. There's a long pause. And so he repeats it again. Okay, go through the glass doors, north tower, glass doors, second stairwell to the right, stairwell B, between the second and fourth floors. And finally, after an even longer pause, the guy on the other side said, we don't even know which building is yours. He had no idea that in, in his little dark hole on the outside of that was a completely different environment than he had left just a few minutes earlier. I heard, I heard a story about the after the tower, towers fell, there was a bit of silence, a bit of just even amidst the confusion, how they began to hear this very specific alarm all over the place going off. And they weren't sure to start with what that was. And then once they realized what it was, it was so eerie because firemen have a, a thing on their uniform that when they stay still in a, a single place for too long, because they're nervous about uh, smoke inhalation or whatever, and there was an alarm goes off on their, on their uniform. And so this same alarm was going off all over the rubble as they were all laying there for too long. I heard a story just this week I hadn't heard before. One of the, one of the men who was on Flight 93 that, that crashed the plane out in Pennsylvania had five-year-old twin daughters. And that really caught my attention because I have five-year-old twin daughters. And so when his wife got the news that for sure he was gone, she sat her two little girls down and she said, Daddy's not coming home. And they said, well, where's he at? As five-year-olds would do, you know, where's he at? And they said, well, he's, he's going to heaven to be with Jesus. So I thought a minute. I said, well, can we call him? I'm like, no, no, honey, you can't call him. Well, will the postman take him a letter? No, honey, the postman won't take him a letter. See, the lives that were changed mean so much more to us than just the numbers that we could, we could spout off. Jesus was a masterful teacher, and he would tell stories uh, to, to teach us, to get our attention, to, to instruct us. Sometimes he would make those stories up. He would, he would create a story about an unknown farmer or something that would kind of paint, paint a picture for us. Other times he would take something that was, they were encountering as they were walking along the road, like the farmer planting some seed or something like that. Other times he would take an event that had happened in their day, and he would use that to, to teach them about the ways of God. We call those stories parables. I heard someone say once about a parable that it's a real life story with a larger than life message. And I would suggest to you that 9-11 was much more than a tragedy or disaster. 9-11 is a parable. It's, it's this real life story that really happened in time and space. It's so painful for those who experienced it. But it's got a larger than life message that all of us can gain from. And I think Jesus would like to teach us so many things out of that day. So many things I remember I learned that day when it happened and since then I've forgotten. So many things that were so clear to me on September the 12th that now I've gotten fuzzy again. So I want us to take some time on this day to remind us ourselves of those things and, and point ourselves back to God. First thing I'd like to suggest that we all should be aware of is that we all owe a debt of respect and honor to those who serve us. It was very clear to me on September the 11th, 12th, 13th. Not always as clear today. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. This is a biblical idea. In Romans 13, Paul says, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And we have so many people who serve us on a regular basis, who put their lives on the line in harm's way on a regular basis. And we're reminded of it on days like today, or especially 10 years ago. But we owe them that debt of respect and honor, I think, every day. Uh, firefighters who, who rush in when everybody else is rushing out. Policemen who stand in the way of, of harm and difficulty to keep us safe. People who are in emergency vehicles or, or doctors, nurses, military, of course, who, who leave their family and go to, around the world to try to keep us safe and keep us free. 
And we owe a debt of gratitude, a debt of respect, a debt of honor to them, so much more than we often give, so much more than I often give. And so what I'd like to do this morning as a church is if you're one of those folks, or if you've been one of those folks in your career, if you would just stand so we can say thanks to you. If you're a police, fireman, medical personnel, military, anybody in the room who fits into those categories, just say thanks to you. extend that just a little bit, and this is minefield territory, so stick with me. We owe, we owe those who make decisions on our behalf a respect of debt and honor as well. And I know the last 10 years, no matter what your political stripe is, and we have everybody in this room, no matter what your political stripe is, you've, you've had moments where you've been very, very proud of the decisions that have been made in Washington, and you've had moments where you've been very upset about the decisions made in Washington. And I, could, I know there's certain, I'm sure some of you, the things that made you so excited are things that made other people very upset, and the things that made you very upset are the things that made other people very excited. And we're all a church in the middle of that. You know, Jesus modeled this for us. The kingdom is so much bigger than political party, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. Jesus, when he was picking his 12 disciples, took the, the political issue of the day, how do you deal with the Romans, and he picked a tax collector who sided with the Romans and a zealot who wanted to kill the Romans, and he put them both on his same team. And he said forever to us that the church, the kingdom, is so much bigger than political angle or party or whatever. And we are a church that tries to model after that. Um, and we owe them, no matter what your take is on political issues, we owe the kingdom unity, and we owe them a debt of honor and gratitude for making some very difficult decisions on our behalf. Romans chapter 13, the, the, ver the verses I was reading to you, the context of that is he's talking in the whole first seven verses of that chapter about how we should see the government authorities in our life and see them with respect and give them the honor they're due because God has had a hand in them being in the place that they're at. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says, All of you must yield to the government rulers. No one rules unless God has given him the power to rule. And no one rules now without that power from God. So those who are against the government are really against what God has commanded, and they will bring punishment on themselves. All of us owe the, those who make very difficult decisions on our behalf a debt of gratitude, a debt of respect, a debt of honor, whether or not you agree with the decisions they make, whether or not I agree with the decisions they make, because we owe them that, and the Bible would, would point us to that sort of lifestyle. You can still have disagreements. You can still be uh, polite and respectful as you're bantering those things about. But we need to give them the respect. And we need to give each other the unity in the midst of that. I'm on, I told first hour, I'm on Facebook very rarely. I have like 800 friends. I'm on there like once every two weeks. It's like I'm a really dedicated addict Facebook person, you know. But I'm on there. And I've not been on there for months. So I don't know if any of this is going on right now. I assume it probably is. But I remember during the last election cycle, all of the friends that I have around the country who I know were, many of them were believers, and many of them were saying such ugly things to one another and about other people. And I just think, as Christians, we've got to be above that. You can disagree, we can disagree with each other, but the kingdom's got to be bigger than that, and we've got to be respectful in our approach. I think the second thing that we are reminded of on those days that we need to remember today is we were reminded that day that we live in a fast-paced, often distracted bubble. I remember that day thinking, in those days that followed, so many people in my life, and myself included, had felt just so disrupted. It's like things that had felt like we were certain ways now don't feel that way anymore. Things seem like they're broken now compared to what they were before. Like we were in this safe little bubble that we don't feel so safe and bubbled anymore. I remember Alan Jackson had a hit song those days that said, Where were you when the world stopped turning? And that phrase caught people's attention because so many people felt that way. That things had just stopped going the way that they used to go. And we still live in that bubble today. We just, we just forget about it. The Bible describes it. Isaiah 40 says, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its peoples are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. The Bible says that God is so much bigger than everything that, that we deal with. And even though we think we're in control of so many things, we're not really in control of much of anything. So much of this world is out of our control, out of our uh, purview of authority. And God's still in control. We still need to lean on Him, but we're just sort of, you know, grasshoppers in the midst of things. Humility, then, has a way of leading us back to God unlike anything else I know of in my life. 
And I remember on those days, so many of us really being more dependent upon God because everything else had been shaken. And that which we leaned on before couldn't be leaned on anymore. So we had to lean on the only thing left, and that was God. I mean, how many of us in those days, just, just think about September, you know, the weeks following. How many of us slowed way down? Do you remember that? Like things that you were so busy rushing around before didn't matter anymore. How many of you slowed way down? How many of you focused on your family and, and people more than you did before? Like you really wanted to just be around. I remember I wanted my kids to be close and just kind of keep an eye on, on them and things. I mean, how many of us did that? How many of us spent time that way? How many of us leaned on God more than we had before? And I remember in those days, anthropologists and, and historians and things said, this will all pass. People will get past this mode that we're all in. And I remember thinking, I was a lot younger then, and I remember thinking, wow, that's not true. I mean, I, I'm going to feel this way forever, you know? And today, if I'm honest, I'm just as fast-paced and distracted and off-base sometimes as I was on September the 10th. I've, I've forgotten it. I've, I've lost those kind of things. We live in this bubble that's not really true. We've just convinced ourselves of it. A third thing I think we should be reminded of today is that selflessness and sacrifice are true virtues. In our fear, we really did find courage. I mean, there's thousands of stories that came out of those days and weeks. I've heard so many of them again, and so many new ones even again this week, of, of people who put someone else ahead of themselves, someone else's safety and well-being and health above their safety and well-being and health. And when we see that, that unifies us no matter what your worldview is, no matter what your background is, no matter what your education is, no matter what your political stripe is. We all get unified when we see somebody being selfless. We all say, that's good. I mean, we may disagree on everything else, but that's good. That's heroic. That's noble. That's honorable. And the reason we feel that way is because God has placed that, that, that virtue inside of us. And when we see it, it taps into something deep within us and we go, okay, that's right, that's true, that's real. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And what we're called to do as believers, if you're a follower of Jesus, what you're called to do is to look outside of yourself and say, how can I help those around me? How can I be more concerned about their well-being, their safety, their goodness, and less concerned about what I want, what I think I feel? You remember in those days following September 11th, how, how unified we all were as a country? We were all like on the same page and all loving it toward each other and people would get along at work who we were spatting the week before and those kind of things. It's, I think there's something about selflessness that bonds people together. And there's this overwhelming sense of selflessness because we were following the examples of those who had sacrificed for us. I heard a great story this week of Ladder Company number 6 out of uh, Chinatown. Some of you may have heard this story. They were one of the first ones to arrive at the Trade Center site after the first building had been hit. And so they're trying to get their equipment off the truck and it took them a while because there was, they said there's monitors falling and landing on the street. There's paper and debris everywhere, things falling out of the sky at these fast rates. And so they're kind of trying to take cover and get their stuff out. And so by the time they got all their stuff out and were getting ready to go into the first tower, the second tower was hit. They are right underneath it. They saw the fireball right there. And so they rerouted and sent up into the second tower. And so they started up into the second tower. And they were well up into the second, because the elevators were off limits. So they were well up into the second tower. They said the, the stairwells were very narrow. And so there's only width for two people to go up and down. And so there's a stream of civilians going down and a stream of firefighters going up, to, up into the flames. And so they got up to like the 75th, I think, floor, something like that, when they felt the rumble of the second tower falling. And because they had radios, they were aware of what was going on, but they could feel. They knew the other tower was going. They could just feel the, the shaking of that building. And so their, their commander made a quick decision, said, we've got to get out of here and, and flush as many people out as we can. And there was some debate about that because firemen don't like to go away from the fire, and the fire was above them, and now he's saying go down. And, but they, they followed the orders, and they all started going down. And each floor, they would open the door and say, you've got to get out, you've got to get out, and they would flush people out. And they got down to somewhere around the 25th floor, somewhere in the mid-20s, and, and they opened a door, and there's a huge area of lots of people. And they'd been told, I guess, by some official to stay where you are, stay where you are. So they were all had gathered together in this conference room. And so the firefighters like, you've got to get out of here. You've got to get out of here now. And so a lot of people flooded out. But then they noticed several people in, with walkers or wheelchairs coming their direction. They're like, this is going to take a while. Because the elevators, you know, don't work. We've got to get them down the stairwell. So four or five firemen would take one person and kind of walk, walk them down. And it got to the last group of, a, of an older disabled person. And Ladder Company 6 was there to meet her. And her name was Josephine. Josephine was an older lady. She had worked up on the 70th floor, somewhere up in there. 
and had made her way down what, 45 flights of stairs and got to the 25th floor, so I can't go any farther. So she had just waited there for somebody to come get her. And so they came and they just began to help her out, and she's like, I can't do it. And they coaxed her down each step and down each flight and down each landing, and finally got her down to the fourth floor. After much cheerleading and much encouragement, she kept saying, I can't go on. Yes, you can. Your grandkids need to see you today. Your kids need to see you today. Let's get you out of this building. So I got her down to the fourth floor, and she finally just sat down and said, I can't go any farther. Just leave me. I mean, I'll stay here. I know what I'm saying. You need to be safe. You've got kids. and You get out of here. I'll stay here. And the firemen won't do that. So they said, no, we're not going to leave you. So they said, we're going to stay right here. You've got to go. You've got to go. I can't do it. And they had this back and forth for several minutes. And then they felt the rumbling again, this very familiar rumbling. And this large gust of wind came down the stairwell and the second tower came on top of them. And out of eight or ten people to survive that tower, all six firemen and Josephine walked out alive a few hours later. And they were in this little pocket that was safe for some way. And they said later, had we left Josephine, we would think we would have been killed because we stayed there with her. That was the pocket that was safe and we think she's our guardian angel, they said. She must be our guardian angel. So just a few years ago, when at her funeral, when she died, you know, eight, I think, years later, they were all there in honor of her, their guardian angel. Now, when we see a story like that, it brings out something deep in us because we say, I would have been very tempted to just leave Josephine. She said it, all right, I got to go, you know. But when you see someone going against their natural instinct to do something really valiant, that brings out something deep within us because God put it there. We need to be reminded on just normal days that selflessness and sacrifice really are the path to real life. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it for my sake. And we've got to be more and more that way. I think a fourth thing that stands out to me this day is that we need, we need to focus, we reminded to focus on truly important things. I mean, do you remember in those days following the, the event, how many things just didn't seem important anymore? Remember the comedians quit performing? Like there wasn't a Jay Leno show, there wasn't a David Letterman show, because they felt like it was petty to do comedy amidst all of the crisis and the funerals in the morning. You know, a lot of the sports events and other entertainment venues shut down because it feels wrong to be entertaining ourselves or celebrating. It just doesn't feel like it's the right place. And there's a period there where so many unimportant things just seemed so clearly unimportant. We focused on that which was most important. Colossians chapter 3, again, it's a biblical value that we latched on to. Colossians 3, Paul says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And what are things that are above? What are things that are in heaven one day? It's God. And so many people depended on God like they never had before. They trusted God and they leaned on God and they spent time following God and, and on people. Because people will always be around. People never end. Even the 3,000 that died that day, they're still around. They're not, they're not gone. They're not eliminated from this life. And so we focused on God in those days and we focused on people in those days and our family in those days because those are the things that are most important. Those are the things that are eternal. You know, everything about our world, everything about our life that day was shaken. And the Bible uses that as an analogy. That when our life is shaken, that which is most important sort of sifts up to the top. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about this. The writer says, at that time, God's voice shook the earth. He's talking about a past event. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That has created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. God says at the end of time, he's gonna, the earth's going to be shaken and only the things that really matter are going to stand out and last. Everything else is going to sort of fall away. I think God uses the shaking events in our life all, all, all the time. 9-11 was unique because we all got shook at the same time. But shaking events come to all of us. You get a bad report from the doctor or your spouse will say, I don't, this is not working anymore. Your kids will go off the track or... Your job will be lost. Your finances will be cry. You, you get shook and your life gets shook. And when you get shook, isn't it true that only the really important things matter anymore? And that which is insignificant sort of is seen for what it is. See, Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, On judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value at all. One day, God is going to look at your life and mine. And we're going to be escorted into heaven or we're going to be sent away from God because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. 
You and I can never do enough good things to, to earn His favor or to put off the bad things that we have done. Only God's grace through Jesus does that. But the Bible makes it very clear that we will one day stand before God and we'll take this one and only life that we have and we'll offer it up to God and it'll be shaken and only the things that really matter will be left and God will see our one and only life for what it really is. And if we focus on the things that are most important and we keep our life focused on that which is most important, then we're going to have all kinds of evidence of the things that mattered in our life. But so many of the things that I spend my time on will not matter on that day. Because when you're shaken, those things sort of sift away. We need to be reminded to focus on that which is most important. One of my favorite stories is out of the Old Testament in the Bible where there's a, I don't make a very long story, a very short story, so bear with me, but there's a, a young girl named Esther who was selected to be the queen of her land. And because she was the queen of her land, she didn't know why she'd been put in that position. That wasn't something she was shooting for. But now she's the queen of her entire country. And right after that, there was uncovered a plot that was going to destroy her family and her people, God's people. And so Mordecai came to her, her cousin came to her and said, uh, you've got to do something about this. And to do something about it meant she had to go before the king. And to go before the king was dangerous. She had to put her life on the line, her, her throne on the line, her royalty on the line, her money on the line, her power and privilege on the line. Everything about her had to be put on the line to, to make this work. And she put it all, and she was debating that. And she was scared. And she was selfish, to be honest. There's things about her that she wanted to hang on to. And Mordecai said, you've got to do this because who knows if you don't what God will do. But who knows that maybe God hasn't put you in this place in this time for such a time as this. And that phrase, I think, is as relevant today as it was when it was spoken thousands of years ago. As a nation, as a community, who's to know that God hasn't brought you here for such a time as this? Now, you thought you were coming here because you had a job opening in Nashville, or you thought you came here because you had a, a house that was in the price range here in Spring Hill, or you thought you came here because you have family in the area. You thought you came here for all kinds of reasons, and maybe that is why you came here, but, but who's to say that God hasn't got you here at this time in this place because you've got a neighbor who needs Jesus? Or maybe you've had a hard time figuring out who Jesus is, and this is finally getting clear to you about who it is and what it means to follow Him, and now you can get your life connected with God. Or maybe, maybe you can be part of this church to do some great things for God on His behalf and to help some people in need. Maybe God's got you here for that guy at work that drives you crazy or the, or the neighbor that just won't leave you alone. And there's something that God has in mind for you to do. And maybe you're here for such a time as this. And God didn't bring you from Ohio or Oklahoma because of your job like you thought. He used that to get you here, but there's something else bigger in mind. You see, when our life is shaken, only the really important things that matter stand out. And often things like career path and 401k and, and job, those things go away. And the house that you're trying to decorate and get to just the right way, that sort of doesn't matter anymore. And the, and the new car you're wanting to buy or lease, that doesn't matter as much anymore. And the, only the really important things matter. And God, I think, is calling to us in this time, in this place, to really get urgent about the things that matter most. And that's only a handful of things. May you and I be reminded on this day the urgency we felt when we were shaken 10 years ago.